Yes, so this is uh, work done together with Paul Thompson, Rahil Nawaz, and Sophia Nanyadu of Manchester University, as well as Maria Leakata at, at EBI. Um, it, uh, it was interesting in preparing a talk for here, I wasn't sure, I wanted to show something new that I hadn't shown before, but I am aware that the audience is not all at the same level of, uh, um, of, of sort of having looked at things about scientific publication. Um, so I wanted to give a very, very quick intro to how do you access the knowledge that is within papers. Um, I think already the discussion this morning has been really fascinating and the thought that whether or not we should have papers in the first place uh, is a very valid and interesting one. Um, currently, however, I think the majority of scientific knowledge is contained within papers and, and one of the main issues is how do you get it out and how do you get it in a form that's reproducible, linkable, etc. Um, so the model that I like to use is that papers are stories that persuade with data, and I'll say a couple of words about that. Um, then really the, 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 the heart of this is um, how is this persuasion done, and uh, I'll briefly be comparing three ways of annotating the key rhetorical moves within the paper. Um, there are three models of annotating uh, what's going on in a paper in terms of the argumentation and, and in terms of where the main points are being made, and I'll, I'll briefly discuss all three. We uh, tried all three types of annotations on a single full-text paper, and I'll show some ideas about conclusions of how this overlaps and, and where this might head. So just about um, the model of, of, of scientific discourse, um, I think essentially if you look at a scientific paper, it is very much structured like a story. This is the story grammar from Thorndike. There was a lot of work in the 70s, Thorndike and Rummelhart and others, um, who identified what are, the, what are the key components in a story. And just like in a fairy tale, um, a scientific paper actually starts with providing some background and with providing sort of a main goal. And you can say the research goal is the main protagonist of a scientific paper. The research goal goes out on a quest, and the research goal is then subjected to these different trials, just like the theories in fairy tales often are. Um, and every experiment offers a next trial for the research question. And, and at the end, just like a good protagonist in a good fairy tale, the research question comes out, you know, hopefully not quite dead, but somehow altered and somehow changed and, and needs to go on a new quest. And that's sort of where the new paper comes up. So I think a lot of the rhetorical blocks, a lot of the, the uh, uh, components that we see in a research paper can really be gleaned from fairy tales. I think there's actually actually very interesting work to be done to look at the work that's being done on, on uh, structuring fairy tales. There's a whole propian fairy tale grammar and I think it would be fascinating field of work to see if we could use that for scientific text. All right, so um, the goal of scientific papers, of course, is not to amuse in the first place. The goal is um, to persuade, and I think that's been mentioned a couple of times this morning already. Um, and again, I think it's quite interesting if you look at the classic philosophers, if you look at the Ars Rhetorica, or you look at Quintilian, who was an, an orator in, in ancient Rome, the components that they say should be in a good persuasive speech, again, quite closely model uh, the components of a scientific research paper. You, so in the beginning, you have the appeal to ethos. I want to tell you that I'm, I know what I'm talking about and I respect you all very much. Then I bring my hard facts and then at the end I, I tell you this is incredibly important and you need to care about this greatly. So I think within a research paper, in a similar way, there's the emotional appeal, there's the establishment of, of cred credibility um, and these components we do see. Um, now, of course, the way that, at least in life sciences and, and a lot of other experimental sciences, the persuasion occurs is through data. Main claims, here is a claim from a random paper, um, the evidence is given through uh, data being either a table or a figure or something like that. So the, so the key argumentation components are data, and I think it's incredibly important to think of we destroy all this data in the writing of a paper. So how can you reconnect, how can you make this data richer and make it link in a much more usable way into the key claims of a paper? All right, that's just a quick introduction. I wanted to talk about the three models that um, at EBI, Manchester, and myself, we've, we've worked on identifying if we really go into the paper, so know how does this persuasion actually happen? Um, because it, it happens, I, I do believe, it happens at a very, very fine-grained level. Um, I'd like to argue that within a biological text, this is a piece of biology text, it actually happens um, in the realm of a clause. So a clause 
for those of you who are not linguists, and I had to learn this, a clause is something essentially that has one verb, right? So every verb does a little mental act. So for instance, in this paper, you see there is a, there is a statement, seminomas and the EC component of non-seminomas share features with ES cells. That is taken to be a statement, a statement of fact. People, uh, this is accepted by the community reading this paper. Now, there, we then get um, I hypothesis. So it might be possible that uh, something is going on and therefore we did this thing um, and found this result. Um, and then here is the implication of this little piece of text. So you see within, and in between the facts and the implications, you see some transitional segments. So you see that every clause essentially has a small rhetorical sub-goal. Um, and in fact, you see that there is conceptual knowledge. The, the paragraph begins and ends with a representation of conceptual knowledge in the field um, that is wrapped uh, around the experimental evidence. And you have these going back and forth in very standard formulations. You know, These results suggest that is used in almost every single paper or some very, very simple iteration of that, saying that we now have this data and this is what we think it represents. Um, you, can, you can look at this in a slightly different way. You can say there is a, there is a fact, there is a problem. Now, there is a, a small sub-goal in this little piece of text um, that motivates the experiments at the bottom, and that then drives the implication. So you see that there are, in essence, three realms of discourse. There's a conceptual discourse that is going on, um, that is then discussed by means of the experiment. So, and this is where the references to data occur, uh, etc. And incidentally, the, the conceptual discourse is done in the present tense. Um, the experimental discourse occurs in the past tense. There's a great parallel with mythology there, actually, that I won't go into right now. Um, and there are wonderful transitions uh, between the two that are that are quite identifiable. All right, so, so I do believe that you can actually go into the text and chop it up into these clauses and identify clauses that correspond to specific uh, concept types. Right. All right, well, I've just introduced my method of annotation. There are other people come up with different methods. Um, Maria Leacata, having worked with uh, uh, so, uh, many people and who's currently working at EBI, looks at a three-layer ontology-motivated annotation scheme for sentence annotation. So she looks at the sentence level and looking at uh, then at three layers. One are the core scientific concepts. And here are core scientific concepts, so every sentence is classified with one of these. Um, one is the property of the core scientific concepts. Specifically, is this a new or is this an old concept? Um, is there an advantage or a disadvantage to the concept? And then there are concept identifiers, so there, it's possible to link different sentences together referring to this concept identifier. Just to show you a little bit, um, these are in fact all the uh, types of, of uh, sentences that she classifies, and this is what it looks like. She has a very nice annotation tool where she can annotate a single sentence with these concepts. All right. Um, the third method um, that I'll briefly discuss is that of bio-event annotation, which was also developed by Tsuji uh, in Japan and is being worked on in Manchester as well. Um, and here you're really looking at, oh, this is not very visible. Well. Uh, you're really looking at biological events. So what their view of bio biological rhetoric is, um, is that this sentence contains two events. There is activates and there is expression. Um, and what we should do is identify these events within the biological con uh, context. So then to that bio event, which can be centered around a verb or it can be centered around something which even spans a number of sentences, it doesn't need to be the granularity of a sentence, they have what they're calling a meta-knowledge annotation, which is saying, all right, so what type of knowledge is this? How sure are we of the knowledge? What's the source? Is the source in the current paper? Is it referring to an external paper? Um, how sure are we? And what is the polarity? Is this a negative or positive statement? And uh, they're applying this right now to the entire Genia corpus. So just to show you, this is what it looks like. Um, you, you take this bio event, you take this representation of what's happening biologically within a sentence, and you annotate it with um, these uh, uh, types of meta-knowledge annotations. All right, so what we've done here is very, very, very small uh, little uh, finger exercise comparing these three annotation schemes. They have slightly different purposes. They have different granularities, um, and they're manual and automated uh, to a different degree. But I think we all try to figure out how we get at the knowledge in the text, and we all believe that we need to look deeply in the text and the way the text is structured to get there. 
All right. So um, this is actually what it looks like if we all three of us annotate the same thing. This is just a bunch of angle brackets. But um, one thing that's quite interesting is you see that, that some of them are much more verbose. The middle thing is the bioevent meta knowledge. They are the only ones who are actually also identifying things like genes and actual uh, biological entities. Then they have this meta analysis saying what is the source, uh, is, it, is it neutral, etc. Um, at top, the chorus C, you see, you see the, the drop downs that Maria was showing. And at bottom, the discourse segments are by far the simplest. I'm just saying this is a discourse segment and this is its type and this is the section of the paper it's in. Right, so I'll show you some graphs which are just to give you an impression that we can do this. So we, we, we looked at one paper and we saw that there were rather large overlaps. This is between chorus C and event meta knowledge. Um, one finding that we see is that certainty level and source can help to refine results and conclusions. So we're finding if we annotate the same corpus with these different annotation schemes, um, actually we find that, that we need to update our annotation schemes. And I think that's the main lesson that can be learned. Um, I'll show you some other graphs. It's, this is not terribly important, but just to show you that, that there is actually quite a lot of overlap here. This is quite interesting. You have the background column is the first one. Um, and these are all the segments that, that I've been using. So you see that the, the, the background column can actually be split in, you're either referring to someone else's hypothesis, someone else's implication, someone else's result. And I actually think this ties in quite nicely to what David was just talking about, um, and also the work of Stephen Wan. Uh, they are different types of annotation if you're referring to a method or you're referring to an implication. Um, so we see that, and here's the last one between segments and meta-knowledge. Um, I think the important thing is that the certainty level seems to be really critical. It's important to say how sure an author is of a certain finding and whether or not it's their own finding or one they're citing. Um, so here are some, some detailed conclusions um, in that we see that there is an overlap between the three schemes. We have different strengths and offer annotation at different levels. The Cora C1 is fine-grained in terms of methods, objectives, and results. Uh, this concept of objective is, is, is uh, very important. Why are you doing it? The meta-knowledge helps you with the certainty level and the types of sources, and the segments offer a refinement of the background information, saying uh, what is it really that you're citing from someone else? And so in general, um, this is a very small example um, I think that the clause level really is necessary if we want to identify claims. And, and this is one hurdle that seems to be there in uh, computational linguistics is that, that for whatever reason it's not that easy to parse these clauses. But it seems to be essential if you want to differentiate between these results suggest that and um, you know, uh, uh, Schott and et al. found that, um, that's a very important distinction. And that means that you need to look at that matrix clause at the sentence surrounding your final statement. Um, the knowledge type and certainty level are very important as well, and, and I think it's useful to come to some kind of common ground to say, how, how do we know this and how sure are we of it? Uh, again, pointing to, to Marianne's work this morning, if you had had papers marked up with this, it might be useful. I'm done. Um, so I think it's important that we work together. Uh, we are in collaboration with, with Gully on KFED. Um, we're talking with Tim Clark on, on SWAN and also the Scalanto. And I think together it's very useful uh, if we can try to overlay all these annotations to collectively come to a claim identifier. And I strongly resist the term fact extraction. I think the best you can do in science is identify claims. So know where you're going to extract facts. Um, and develop standards for the modality and evidence scales and types um, so that collectively we can start working towards something like a claim evidence network, what we've also referred to in the past as hypothesis evidence and relationships. And I think that might offer a really interesting way of surveying the literature uh, and seeing how assertions are carried forward. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. Very, very interesting. We have very just two, two minutes. Um, Paul? So this looks very cool, but it looks very complicated and it looks like a lot of hard work to do this. Who does this? Right, so we're working towards doing it automatically. Um, we're not there yet. Right now people are developing manually annotated corpuses to train uh, machine learning especially is what is what Maria is working on. Agnes Shandor at Xerox is working uh, really on a, on a syntax uh, parser to do it in, in, in more detail. So I think 
Um, oh, shoot, I wanted to shoot, show this last slide, sorry. We actually, <laughs> we have a workshop uh, in June after ACL where we would very much like to talk about what is the background behind some of this, because I think some of the work in computational linguistics is driven by what, what is possible, but not necessarily by what's useful for scientists. Um, it might be that there's low-hanging fruit, such as the methods section, uh, for instance, that you can pull up with rel relatively little effort. Um, and it might be that this kind of holy grail of finding the claims, you know, is too far-fetched right now for current technologies. So I think it's very important going forward that, 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 that we, we keep the discussion ongoing between the people using this type of content and the people being able to pull it out of papers. And eventually working towards things like editorial tools that would allow an author to, to, to indicate these things would also be interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. Let's go 